I'm hoping that you can hear me because we are at the SHARE conference right here, right now. I told you, I promised that we are going to be live. Um, and today, my name is Leticia Caro here with Tish Talks Tech, and we have Rich Herbeck. How's it going? Live. Hello, everybody. Hi. So um, we are here at the SHARE conference in New Orleans. It is such a a beautiful turnout. There are so many people here. I have not been able to count. Today is only Sunday, um, but let me tell you that the hotel is just jam-packed. There are so many things that are happening right now. There's um, like a pregame going on with, I think it's the Kansas City Chiefs and uh, the Saints. So there's a ton. Yeah, there's a ton of people here. There's also a lot of folks here for the conference. We have a line queued up right now for people to get uh, booked in and registered for the, the conference. And it is just a madhouse here. I'm telling you that the mainframe is where it's at and people are so excited. But Reg and I are here to talk today because we have been planning this for how long? I don't know, about uh, four years. It feels like it. <laughs> <laughs> but we are so excited. Um, Reg, you are an IBM champion. Go ahead and introduce yourself because I don't I don't know. If you guys don't know Reg, Reg is pretty popular. For a matter of fact. Among mainframers. Among mainframers and, and, and a lot of people that just really know this space. But go ahead and um, introduce yourself. Okay, sure. Now, I, I'll just mention that we're doing something funny with our headphones, and we're hoping that you can hear our voices. So if anybody's tuned in yet, and if you can just kind of give us a little chat and say if you can hear us. Um, and, and let's see. Hey, PJ. Hey, PJ, can you hear us both? Because uh, we don't know if the uh, microphones are picking us both up or not. So um, so anyway, while well, we're waiting to find out if, if you can hear us fine. Uh, so I'm Red Charvik. Uh, I've been uh, a uh, mainframe nerd since 1987 and uh, a share attendee uh, since about 1999, uh, being involved in a whole bunch of different things. In fact, uh, Leticia and I just got our badges, and so I, I've got more ribbons on my badge <laughs> this time than, than ever before. Uh, so I, I'm very enthusiastic about all this mainframe stuff. Uh, so my mainframe crew started as being a CIC or Kix systems programmer, and then it became an MVS systems programmer, and then the security. And, oh, good. You can hear it. Great. Uh, awesome. Thank that, you, That is Caitlin. so to relief to know. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I'm just basically uh, being active both as a technologist and then also as a writer and a presenter, as an educator. Uh, and um, I'm really happy to also be not only an IBM champion for, for Zed, but in fact, the first one in Canada, I unfortunately now have a colleague of mine uh, who is uh, also an IBM champion for Z in Canada. Uh, and um, so it's, it's just kind of neat, the, this whole space. And, and this is such an important time in the history of mainframe to be a mainframer because we're really about to round the knee of the curve where we've spent, you know, like 59 years becoming an overnight success. And suddenly everything everybody needs, they're about to discover the mainframe already has. So that's just Ooh. the beginning of what I have to say about See, now this. Now you're, you're starting up already. <laughs> okay, so back to you before I take the whole uh, session. You are starting up because you know what? That's that's a big deal. What everybody's discovering is what the mainframe already has. Yeah. yeah. But expound on that. <laughs> I well, love that piece. Well, here it's, it's such a funny thing because, you know, I mean, the, the work that went into creating the original multi-purpose general purpose computer 360 degrees of functionality IBM yeah. system 360 okay. that that was basically from the first from the last electromechanical computer and the first electronic computer back in the mid to late 40s mm -hmm. until IBM announced system 360 in 1964 that whole journey led up to the ultimate computer and the thing is Nobody expected System 360 to become the ultimate computer in history, but once they made it, everybody else went off and tried to elaborate other directions, you know, create a computer, uh, consumer electronic computers, that sort of thing. But they, they didn't want to bother reinventing the wheel, that whole 360 degree invention that did mm. everything. And so throughout the history of computing, what everybody missed was that the mainframe had done everything so well that people just took that stuff for granted and went off and did other stuff. And, and you know, the other systems really not much more than embedded systems in some ways compared to the comprehensive functionality that was first of all intentionally built into the mainframe and then built up 
with the mainframe, you know, all the other disciplines that we learned, um, you know, storage management, security, networking, you know, application development, all these you know, automation, on and on and on, were developed and, and created and elaborated and fine-tuned on the mainframe, while every other platform was just basically learning how to commoditize consumer electronics computing. You know, and then having done that, then they tried to turn it into business computing and retro uh, systems that were basically built like an upside down pyramid where they're just piling layer and layer and layer and layer to try and make it seem like a business computer. Uh, and the only criteria they had for whether or not it was succeeding is how much it was like the mainframe, you know, which was already doing all this stuff. And, you know, so, so they were it, adding it, all of these pieces yeah, after the fact. That, that wow, you know, I didn't are, look at just, it like that. Just kind of, well, they're, they're like layer upon layer upon layer. It's like yeah. slapping pancakes on top of this thing to make a bigger and bigger and bigger mound. Uh, and as a result, you've got you know, some people characterize Windows as being the, the most complex piece of software ever written. Uh, and, and I think if that is the case, that that certainly is a, a, an illustration of the fact that being complex and, and for that matter, just being complicated is not the same as being uh, functional and quality. You know, uh, and so uh, we take a look at the history of all these other non-mainframe operating systems and platforms and everything, and they've really been slapped, you know, layer upon layer upon layer, in order to try to catch up with something they'll never quite reach because they max out at about thirty-five percent busy, whereas the mainframe is always one hundred percent busy. So you know, all these really interesting things that basically the the biases that were baked into the educational system for the past half century uh, against the mainframe have, have created a whole generation of people who automatically rejected the mainframe by default and that generation is no longer the current generation that generation is rolling off the top now and a new generation is rediscovering the mainframe without those built and biases because they weren't fed the the uh, all, all this stuff about because everybody assumed the game was over the mainframe was lost when in fact the game was over and the mainframe was still the only game in town the only game what do you think about it you know if, if you're doing world-class business then at some point you're passing through the mainframe and if you're a world-class organization, you probably had your corporate jewels on the mainframe. And all of these other platforms generally are only functional at that level if they're talking to a mainframe and treating it as a core repository for functionality and data. Uh, you know, if you're doing stuff that is not as business critical, great. You know, all these platforms have their place. But if you're doing stuff that has to be right, has to keep its uh, integrity, mm -hmm. validity, availability, security, all these things uh, at the volume, a world-class volume, you're using the mainframe because no other, no other platform can touch the features, the functionality, the qualities of service that we take so for granted on the mainframe that we don't even think about the fact that nobody else does. <clears throat> that that was a mouthful, Reg. <laughs> that was a mouthful. But you know what? Let's take it apart and unpack it. Sure. So if you are doing world class business. You're not using something clunky. You're using something that you're using a piece of machinery, some engineering, something that takes thought, like a mainframe, the mainframe. Mm -hmm. You're utilizing it because you are doing world class business. Mm -hmm. You're not utilizing bits and pieces. You're not nickeling and diming yourself. You are utilizing the right tool for the right job. That's what right, you're doing. Yeah. And it's with the right integrity, with uh, comprehensive completeness uh, and the tried and proven this that only true legacy system has. Ooh. Can we put that on a shirt? Yeah, let's do that. Let's well, do I've that. already got something on a shirt. I see you. I so see I that's a, your book. I, that's my book. Well, my book and Dr. Cameron Say and Carl Eric Stem Force mm -hmm. and David Boyd's book. Of course. That's right. That's right. I love that. And I love how you explain it because I think that at the end of the day, a lot of people don't understand why we're so passionate about this platform. Because at the end of the day, and even in the middle, y'all, especially and in, in, in maybe maybe at 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 uh, eleven fifty nine, we have to be able to run batch. You have to be able to create your transactions, back up your transactions, make sure there's no events. There's got to be some log, okay? And we have to be able to track. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that in bits and pieces. You just can't do that. You have to have the right tool for the right job. And if you're running a world-class business, you have to have the proper enterprise system. And it's interesting. You, know, you say at the end of the day, and you know, that, that's another reminder that 
Tell us about time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know, the, 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 at the end of the day mm -hmm. is a new day. And when that new day comes along, is your technology still there for you? Because the mainframe is designed to be there at the beginning of the next day as well. In fact, That's it reminds it. me of something that uh, somebody once said. They'd been on a project to move off of the mainframe. And they said, we've been sunsetting this thing for so long, the sun's coming back up again. Because at mm. the end of the day, the mainframe's still there. It's still there. It's still there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Water and everything. I love that. So tell me this then. I know that you have like a huge um, product knowledge base of certain software and certain products. Some of the CA products from Matterback. What's your favorite? Oh, I have an answer for that. But before I give you the answer, let me preface it by saying if there are literally hundreds of different products on the mainframe. Yeah. And if the other ones that are my favorites weren't there, that, that product would be my favorite because the incredible quality yeah. uh, of, you know, uh, the design and everything. And so if, if the product I named for you didn't exist, there are literally a hundred other products queued up that could easily be my favorite product. They're all so amazing. Okay. okay. Now that said, okay. This, this is going to be used for and against me, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> okay. Ops MBS. Ops MBS really? is my favorite product. Okay. And I want to, I want five key reasons as to why I know you can, I would say, give me your top one. Uh uh. I need five. Okay. The first reason is Rex, believe it or not. Okay. Because that's where I learned Rex. Uh, and Rex is my favorite programming language. Uh, and basically writing uh, Rex for Ops MVS, which I did in the early 90s, uh, mm -hmm. is how I learned Rex. And, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a techie nerd in my own way. And for me, I, you know, for me, my video games have always been writing computer programs. Right. You know, and, and so the, the next thing was just that Rex had the ability to see everything that was happening on the main thing through Ops MBS. That's so it. that so that I could interact, I could write a Rex program and be, you know, uh, turning the steering wheel, pushing the accelerator, changing gears, all that stuff. Okay. But not only You that, like stuff that's actionable. I've oh, noticed yeah. that about you. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Uh, and and so then also that my Rex programs could be triggered as rules. You know, one of the original ideas of artificial intelligence is this whole rule-based way of doing things where a condition, an event uh, yeah. would happen and it would trigger this rule. Uh, and so as a result, this program you'd written would run at the moment that event happened and you could create all these really neat things responding to having all the information about what had just happened available as variables. Mm -hmm. And so now I'll grant you a lot of things I'm telling you about Ops MBS are to some degree true of a number of other mainframe products that are also amazing products, mm -hmm. including some of the competitors. Um, but that said, then, okay, so those are the first three things. Um, the next thing is actually the community. Uh, the, everything from the developers of Ops MBS to the, the people who write it together. You know, I got to get to know, I went to Ops Exchange in 1992 and, and met a bunch of these folks, um, such as Asher Aaronbend, you know, all these, these uh, Tim Bruner was, was also busy with, Ops MVS, but but all these these people who because that's one of the beauties of the mainframe is more than any other platform. It's about every individual who's part of our ecosystem. You know, and that's because we have such a tiny ecosystem running the world economy. You know that that people get to know each other. You know, and so here it's a, chair, a very tight community. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Everybody's like, hi. I'm like, hi. Yeah, exactly. You know, we're sitting here facing the registration desk. Yeah. So people come along, and I'm waving as they these you know sign in because you know we recognize so many of these folks. You know, it's so neat to see them and wave to them. Um, yeah, and so the, the, the community of the mainframe is, is so completely different from uh, the community of any other platform. Uh, and so the, tell us about starting in Rex with Ops and VS. have to try it. Oh, yeah. Um, so let me, before I dig any, well, let, let me just also say that Complete Ops and VS number has, a, five. Whole lot of, yeah, has yeah. a whole lot of different Places that it reaches out and touches everything from from the you know uh, screen scrapable terminal mm -hmm. to virtual terminals to talking directly to, to kicks to mm -hmm. um, you know every different thing you know that's got a, an option or a function feature uh, including having you know multi system uh, and, and even then talking to offboard you know automation so they can be part of the whole enterprise wide automation um, but that said you know okay Mike Kaldashaw is one of my personal heroes uh, the the guy is just an amazing historical genius. Uh, and uh, I'm actually friends with him on Facebook, which is like, 
wow. Wow. Um, you know, uh, and, and he's, he's quite Talk about me having a, a small community. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm actually friends with the guy that invented Rex. Yeah, and, and I, I've interviewed him about <laughs> oh Rex. Oh, my gosh. And, and really? he basically, he woke up in the middle of the night with a fully formed idea of Rex back in the late 1970s. Get out of and, here. And then basically, Are you serious? Yeah, and so he wrote out the spec for the language and then wrote out the language based on that spec. Okay? And so he... What? Had, yeah. So, because he was familiar with what was being done at script, like pocket automation with exact yeah. exact to uh, VM and CMS, all that stuff, and and so he just woke up with this amazing vision, and <clears throat> and Rex just wrote such, it out. Yeah, and then created Rex based on that vision. So he spec'd it out and then wrote to that vision, and and so it he just, ten commandments the Rex. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you didn't have to download to tablets either. <laughs> but. <I> it, <laughs> But it was, it, 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 it's this amazing wow. language, you know, because yeah. uh, let, let me admit one of my personal foibles. I like basic. Uh, basic was my first language. Yeah. Uh, I'm an interpreted language guy. I, I, I write assembler. I write cool. I love cool. You know, yeah. I, I, I write other compiled languages, but I'm happiest when I can write a language and run it just like that, you know, uh, and write scripts just make me happy. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the opportunity then to write automation and test it and have it right away you know and so um so the just the, the fact that rex was such a perfect match for automation mm -hmm. but for so many other things you know i have to say uh, i had an opportunity and when we were writing this book just at the beginning of this we actually mm -hmm. uh the four of us got on a conference call with ross morgan uh and just told him what we were thinking and just kind of got some input and i told him you know what you need to change jcl to include rex Mm. It didn't go anywhere, but he was really polite about it. You know, he said, "Okay, well, it said Meredith was a soul was on the call. He said, Meredith, can you set Reg up with somebody to talk about this?" And, and, and they really intended to, I'm sure. Um, but no. in any case, uh, I I really think you know it's, it's nice to have the, the if and then functionality in JCL. Uh, I wish there was something we could get rid of the cont in JCL. I'm going to write a poem about cont by cont one of these days. But but I think we if go. we're able to add some Rex. Uh, syntax into jcl it could make it so much easier because the problem is you're not going to replace jcl with python for the simple reason you just too much legacy regs yeah sorry too much legacy jcl no such thing as too much too much regs. Regs, but yeah. um that that would be really nice however that's it i i, I tangentize um back to you. that's that's good that's really good i want to i want to ask um let me let me make sure that I didn't miss anybody in chat and and also let me make sure that I, I shout this out ESPN 1061 Richmond hello um, uh, and everyone in chat hello PJ and Caitlin Carl I know you're on um, so let me ask you this what about what about what's happening now you you mentioned Python okay and there's a lot of new folks that are coming on to the platform mm -hmm. so what's your take on that and how do you feel about some of the new languages that are coming to the platform you know the, the first answer i give you is that the mainframe always has been the ideal and ultimate platform for anything new the problem is it does the established stuff so well that we tend to be a little bit protective of it Mm -hmm. and don't want to expose it to new stuff because we've got too much critical workload happening on it with the old stuff. But the, the, the fact is that the mainframe is genuinely the greatest computer ever invented. And, and I think a thousand years from now, that will still be acknowledged as the case. The IBM System 360% of mainframe, it, that they got it right. And everything else is just sort of being, you know, uh, tickling the niche areas. And some of those niches are really giant customer, you know, consumer areas. Yeah. But the thing is, if you want to do something right, the mainframe is the one platform where it's guaranteed to be possible. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you will, but it's you can, you know. And so it, of course, makes sense that all of these new uh, languages and all these other things can can come on to the mainframe and have, because uh, there, there's three reasons that that is the case. The first one is, of course, that we have a new generation of people coming on there who know those languages, yeah, and and who can do cool new stuff with those languages and that's that's important you know to, to have the mainframe accessible 
to them. Mm-hmm. Second of all, is there's all these packages that are out there written in these languages. You know, I mean, we, we've got Linux on the mainframe. We've got containers now on the mainframe. You know, we've got all these other things on the mainframe. Well, if we're going to be able to take stuff off the distributed world and make it available on the mainframe as well, mm-hmm. then we have to be compatible with that. Right. Um, and so those are two of the three reasons. And I'm sure I had a third reason, which I might think of later on. But moving along to the next topic. The next topic would be, why aren't they teaching some of the legacy programming at schools? Or what are your <sighs> what are your thoughts on that? Because, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. why? So, okay, uh, some of you may know that back in 2004, uh, I wrote a white paper called um, Mainframe Continuity Plan, about the need to get a new generation of mainframe. I had already been active on the mainframe for quite some time. Quite some time, by the way. And I'd been meeting with mainframe shops, and the one thing I found consistently was that, well, as as, as I was good at back then, you know, I would go to a mainframe shop, and I'd say, say, so tell me, do you have more or less distributed computing power than you had 10 years ago? And they'd say, more. Do you have more or fewer main or like distributed computing people? Oh, more. Okay, so do you have more or less mainframe power than you had 10 years ago? More. Do you have more or fewer mainframe people? Fewer. You know, and on the one hand, I mean, IBM and all the mainframe, other mainframe vendors in the ecosystem have been making it more and more maintainable, self-managing, all these wonderful things. They keep doing that. You know, look at the latest announcement uh, of uh, the latest version of, of ZOS, uh, where they've got the AI built into the ability for self-management, yeah. all these things. You know, and so, I mean, it takes fewer and fewer people to manage them. Mm-hmm. But wouldn't it be better to use the, the additional person hours you freed up to do new things on the mainframe when it's such an ultimate ideal platform for that? Mm-hmm. But the problem is that since the beginning of consumer electronic computing, the message is being gotten out over and over and over again to have been hammered with it that this mainframe is, you know, this old dead legacy, even as it was running the world economy. And so one of the first places that that affected was educational institutions where the, they just weren't teaching people new mainframe with a few outstanding examples such as Jeff Decker and Dr. Cameron say, you know, um, we're doing some great teaching of mainframe, but they, they stand out partly because there's so few people doing that, you know, and so uh, you, the average mainframer, it turns out, has always learned more on the job than in university or college right now. Um, and it would be nice if you were learning more at university and college and such. But I think we have to also recognize that there's something profoundly practical and not academic about mainframe computing. You know, and, and this is something, I, I'm a natural academic, you know, I, uh, just a year and a half ago, I finished a master's degree, um, you know, after doing my computer science degree, literally 35 years earlier. Right. You know, uh, so it I took a little break. Yeah. I just had to digest all that computer science. Yeah. But, but I, I found in my journey, I was just talking with Joe Winchester actually half an hour ago about this, you know, that, that uh, you, you learn computing by doing it, not by learning theoretically about it. And this is yeah. one of the problems. We have this thing called death by PowerPoint where people will go to learn about technology and they'll be just pummeled by PowerPoint, but it won't connect with their sense of reality because they would actually have a chance to get up with their elbows in it. Well, this is how we actually learn technology, such as computing technologies by working with it. You know, and it's something we learn very similar to how you know learn woodworking or any of the other traditional trades, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think part of the issue is that our, our model of teaching people about computing has not um, matched our experience of computing, which is stuck with this, this academic approach. And so on the one hand, it seems like a tragedy that we don't have more mainframe being taught in university, but on the other hand, there's something to be said for just having organizations get back on board and, and mentor their new people into the mainframe. And of course, you have some great programs, um, mm-hmm. such as the Broadcom Vitality Program and mm-hmm. uh, you know a number of other such uh, things that are helping people get a new generation in place. But it really is so, so substantially on the job that, that, that has to be part of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a whole thing. And, you know, it's so hard because there's where I see it is, is like, there's no, there's this big gap. So when people are in school, they're not even exposed Mm -hmm. to mainframe. They don't, they don't even see it. They're exposed to bias against me. That part. And this, this gets to another story that I don't know if I alluded to in our conversation here because I talked about it earlier in something today, but that back in the beginning of the computing era, uh, the last great uh, electromechanical computer, I think it was, was the, the possibly the Mark One. Uh, I need to verify that, but that Harvard uh, created this um, this machine with a lot of investment from IBM. Mm-hmm. Um, and what happened 
was that uh, the IBM's uh, CEO, uh, Thomas Watson Sr., went to Harvard to, or the press release announcement only to discover that they'd done it the day before he got there. And, you know, there's, there's just this, this tremendous disconnect between the business side and the academic side. And, you know, one can spend a lot of time theorizing about why that's the case. And I have a lot of opinions about the matter myself. But what it really comes down to is that IBM has always been all business. You know, that IBM is about what their customers need, about genuine, practical business results with integrity and not about appearances. And although we like to think that academia is not about appearances, uh, we have to recognize that reputation is a very big part of academia. You know, the old publisher parish and all that. And so that there are slightly different requirements in a world of academia from a world of doing genuine business. And so there's always been that, that divergence between IBM type computing, which is about practical results, and academic computing, which is much more about what's the next interesting thing than what can become a trusted legacy. You know, and so I think that's been a challenge all along and we're now having to, to really reap the consequences of that in the world of computing is that the computing that actually works isn't necessarily the computing that's fascinating to the academics, but it's a computing that runs world economy. It would be so lovely if we could have conversations that could bridge that gap mm. and say, you know, this is what's actually here and we need you guys to teach this, mm. <laughs> you know, I don't have all the answers, but it would be really lovely if something like that could happen, yeah. you know? Um, so tell me this then, what, what is your, I want to, I want to talk about right now. I know that you, you teach a lot, you teach a lot of classes and you're always so busy, which is really cool. What's your favorite class to teach? Oh, you're, I'm going to have to mention product names again. So again, let me preface this by saying there are a lot of products that I love and I love to teach courses about. And, mm -hmm. and thanks to the good folks at ProTech, I've been uh, able to teach a lot of courses, many of them Broadcom courses. Uh, yeah. Courses also about IBM things. I've taught courses about Rex, about JCL, about ISPF. I've taught courses uh, you know, about workload automation, automation performance. I love okay. all these products. But interestingly, even though I've taught courses about Ops MBS, my favorite course to teach is actually an introduction to Top Secret. Really? Yeah. And but you're a security secret, guy. Yeah. And, and uh, the top secret, which is one of the three ESMs, or external security managers on the mainframe, mm -hmm. there's ACF2, top secret, and RACF. And each one of them is so world class that there's no other platform that has anything like it. Talk and they it. compete with each other in wonderful ways. Even ACF2 and top secret, which are both Broadcom products, have, have a really interesting kind of quasi competition, even though two thirds of the code base, as I understand it, is the same now between them, but they grew up separate. Um, but the history of mainframe computing security is that wonderful cross-pollinization slash competition that allowed all three products to be so amazing and world-class and, and you know, each one of them to differentiate and improve compared to the other ones, but at the same time offering the same base functionality no matter which one you use. And so uh, on the one hand, I've had the opportunity to work a lot with all three products and, and uh, even worked on projects to create security technical implementation guides or sticks. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, all three products are great products, and, and I'm happy to teach courses about all three, but I just got a special place in my heart for Top Secret because it was the first mainframe security product that I really worked closely with. And I wrote, a, back in the 1990s, I wrote a whole lot of Rex to do a whole lot of stuff that now is part of the product. Um, you know, and you know, so I, I wrote Rex to actually do a sysout trap from a list from Top Secret that would then reverse and turn it into the commands necessary to create that. You know, and so I just have this this deep sense of how top secret works. That's just your And thing. I just get such a kick out of teaching it to students because my enthusiasm for it really comes across and the students get all excited about it as well. So I'm, I'm happy to teach courses about all these products and I enjoy all of them. And, and I try really hard to make sure my students always have that great experience. And, and the, the ratings I get seem to indicate that I'm probably succeeding. But, but since you asked me to name a specific, I'm not going to shy away from that and say, yeah. I know. You know the introduction to top secret of all the courses I love teaching is my favorite. Okay, Reg. Oh. Oh. So. Okay, I love that. Let's let's get into the chat. I see. Let's see. I have Caitlin that I didn't publish, and she says death by PowerPoint. Absolutely, yeah, yeah death by power. I can't stand PowerPoint slides. I know that they are essential, um, but sometimes it can be very very daunting. Um, let's see, who else do we have here? We have um, P. 
PJ saying accessibility and awareness are critical to longevity of the mainframe. By That's the way, huge. so is PJ. You know, let, let me we just, I want to shout out PJ. Uh, PJ, I have to meet you in person. Uh, you uh, are such a critically important contributor the man, the to myth, our the ecosystem legend. right now. Yeah. And have you seen some some PJ's, um, not the TikToks, the... Um, I've seen some of his stuff. The Instagrams? I, I haven't seen nearly enough of it. Everything I see is just amazing. They I just have to make so, time to see more of it. So, like, some of the things, like, the other day, he had posted one talking about um, creating a ticket. And he was like, this is how you create a ticket. It's so catchy, you know, and, and, and it really helps you to think. Mm -hmm. And that's what, and we were talking about that last night. Yeah about this is how you, just this little bit of information and then you publish it this is what you need to know mm. this is how you think we were just talking about that last night there you go so there he's you part go. of that whole conversation uh, that whole moving along um so that was the <laughs> you had to be you're welcome there. bj yeah yeah you're welcome so um and then here we are with georges Hi, Georges. It's nice to see no, you. No, I'm going to correct your pronunciation. He's in French. It's he is. Georges. Georges. Thank you, Reg. <laughs> and then we have. Je uh, vous en prie. Oh, my gosh. Here we go. <laughs> and then uh, let's see here. Aw. Aw. We got the love in the house. And then we've got Caitlin. All of you guys are here. Um, yeah. Yeah. PJ's. PJ is pretty cool. So again, you know, I I really like um, I like how everybody is just so warm and comforting, um, and we are only halfway in. So again, the we're here at the Share Conference, and it is a beautiful Sunday. There's football happening here in New Orleans. There's Reg Harbeck. IBM champion happening here in New There's Berlin. There's Leticia Caro, IBM champion. IBM champion, inaugural year. Um, and the share registration is happening hard and strong. There are so many people here, you guys. So many people here. I cannot believe. You know what? This might be probably the grandest of all the shares that I've been to. Let's see. How many have yeah. I been to? This, well, I remember your three? first share was in uh, Dallas back in 2020. Uh, I think in uh, March of 20. Was it, I thought it was March of 2020. Is that Dallas 2020? I, I thought it was. Maybe uh, I could be off by half a year. If, if, if Dallas, maybe you're right. Dallas was in the summer of 2019. Was that I'm the summer? Off. Yeah. Okay. Well, one of those two. In any case. Yeah. Yeah. But and I then, do think it was actually. No, I do think it was the. the winter yeah March I, of 2020. I didn't go to Atlanta so I went to Dallas no this is three so mm -hmm. I went to Dallas then Columbus right that was two yeah I think yes I remember yeah you were Columbus and mm -hmm. now this one and now this was so this is three mm -hmm. yeah. so in Dallas I thought was huge because that was I mean it was all well, over. that was right before COVID hit. yeah you know like I actually uh, I actually wore like a, a mask on the airplane, uh, and I was the only person doing that. You know, I go through Denver Airport, and I'm wearing the the, the mask, right? Yeah. And, and I was the only person in the whole airport wearing a mask. And, yeah, like, it really wasn't popular about. then. Yeah, and then let's see, and then Columbus, mm -hmm. which was one of the first. I don't that know. That was the second share after the. I think the first share after the uh, COVID or when COVID was just winding down was Houston. Or, I'm sorry, uh, Fort Worth. Fort Worth. Because it was Dallas and then Fort Worth, which is really ironic. I wasn't the one in Dallas. I was at the one in Fort Worth. We were the, okay, it was, we first tried it was Fort Worth in 2020 yeah. and then Dallas. And, and, okay. Yeah, see. <laughs> it's, it's Fort Worth, Dallas, not Dallas, Fort Worth. So, so, yeah, so now we're here. But there's so many people, you guys. And, yeah. and it's the community has come out. And we are just so happy and excited to see everybody. Yeah. And, again, um, if, if you've never – then to share. This is probably the creme de la creme of enterprise. It, I'm not going to say probably. It is the creme de la creme of, of enterprise conferences. Um, and, and you can find what you need here. You can find your group. Um, 
everything is here. Yeah, and one of the beauties of it is that although it's a creme de la creme, we discover that every person who comes here, even for people on their first share, yeah. are, w without trying to be you know uh, arrogant about it, just everybody who comes here turns out to be also creme de la creme. They just are discovering their peeps. You know, that that it, yeah. it can take you a few reasons to share to start to feel at home because, you know, mainframes are often really introverted people who Absolutely. are just much more interested in facing the screen than dealing with people. And so they come to share and they're like wallflowers for the first few shares and they slowly figure out that they fit, that they belong here, and that all these really famous, important mainframers okay. are just like them. In fact, that they're of the exact same ilk, they're cut from the same cloth. And they're so welcoming. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you have not been, and if you you are apprehensive and don't want, you know, oh, I don't think I want to come. No, don't, don't do that. Don't count yourself out to get here. You have to figure out a way and say, you know what? I owe it to me mm -hmm. and it's time to, it's your time to shine. And it's time to own the fact that yeah. you are an individual contributor and participant in the greatest computing platform in history. And you know, every other platform, you know, um, all these distributed consumer electronic platforms, you know, for example, if you've got an issue and you call the, the help desk, you know, the, you, you get your complaint added into a million other complaints of the same kind that they might do something for. Yeah. With, with the mainframe, you call the help desk and no matter which of the vendors, IBM, Broadcom, BMC, uh, Rocket, you know, and on and on and on. And they get to know you personally because you are an individual of great value just being a member of the mainframe ecosystem. And that is so incredibly- an individual unique. of great value. Every last mainframer is. Ooh. And we need to get used to that as mainframers because we don't think that about ourselves because in our organizations where we work, unless they're actual you know, technology organizations, they don't give us the message that we're special and valuable. You know, they, they give us the message that we're old legacy and going away and you got this job because nobody else would take it. But then you suddenly, start to discover your role in this ecosystem and you discover you're part of something really important, really special. And you are part of that by being identified as one of the people who is very important and contributing to something world-class, unique, historical, and definitively uh, making the world economy run. How can we change the narrative? I've been saying this for a while. Okay. So we as mainframers and not you and I, and not our group, but there's some mainframers that will write entire articles that say things like, mainframe isn't dead. Why are we putting that out there? Like it's well, a whole tagline. Why can't we just say, look at the cool stuff that we're doing on the mainframe. Yeah. Look at how wonderful the mainframe is and just start there and then allow for the new people to come to the mainframe and be like, you're so awesome. And you're like one of, 10,000 that actually work on this platform. It, Why can't we just do that? Let me summarize the whole issue in one popular expression. Okay, I'm ready. Hold on, let me brace myself. The mainframe isn't going anywhere. And there you have it. This is what people say when they think they're defending the mainframe. Great people, people who know what's happening. Bless their people hearts. People who, who care about the mainframe will say in all earnestness, the mainframe isn't going anywhere. And, and it's not dead. That, yeah, the mainframe is going everywhere. You know, and and, and the, it's and it's everywhere. Can yeah, we say that? Yeah. Well, I haven't found Talk any man truck yet. I'm working on it. There you go. But, oh my goodness. But here, here's the thing: is that people think they're defending the mainframe by saying, "I'm not dead yet." I'm not going anywhere. Oh, that and, just burns my grits. Yeah. Keep going. And, and and what we should be doing is is getting into that frame of mind of saying, this is the ultimate platform for new workloads because it's the one platform where those new workloads will work well. You know, and, and unfortunately, we've got all these, you know, also RAM platforms that are slowly disintegrating and, you know, become absorbed by the cloud, which, of course, the mainframe eventually will absorb the cloud because it's the only platform that has the quality of services that we assume we should be able to take for granted in the cloud, you know. And, but and the mainframe the, virtualizes, and yeah, that's what I don't. I don't get why is everybody so upset. It good virtualizes. Question. Stop. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I, I think part of it is you know just the whole idea of cloud, because of course the reason the word cloud is so popular is because it makes it somebody else's problem. It's deliberately to use a pun nebulous. 
you know, that as somebody once said, the college is just somebody else's computer. But that's the whole idea. Is it's you know, it's like Scott Adams wrote about in his Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. There's somebody else. Are we getting ready to quote this? Uh, yeah. Well, okay, yeah. and it, say it again. H H G G. Somebody else's problem. Okay. <laughs> um, so the, the 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 idea that Scott Adams invented uh, in so not Scott Adams, sorry, Douglas Adams. Douglas Adams. Adams. Two guys confused. Story. It's okay. No, not not Dilbert. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah. But anyway, that the, 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 the somebody else's problem field was the idea that they, they parked a spaceship right in the middle of a cricket pitch and nobody could see it because it wasn't their problem. And so they, they, I think it was, it might have been Zaffa Beeblebrox, uh, but somebody in there basically was jumping around and looking out the corner of his eyes. Yes, Douglas Adams, thank you, PJ. Uh, in order to see something that he was He's being, a part of our uh, group. Excellent. Um, <laughs> but that, that, you know, that to see something that his brain was being told it didn't care about. By yeah. the way, we have those uh, in the mainframe too. My yeah. favorite example of somebody else's problem field in the mainframe is that everybody looks at CICS and knows that it's not pronounced six. Why do people ever say that? Anyway. that? Just we automatically know that CICS is not pronounced six. The only question is then do we pronounce it CICS or do we pronounce it kicks? But anyway, I'm, I'm tangent, tangentializing. That's okay. Uh, so keep it going. So uh, getting back to somebody else's problem. Field, yeah. Uh, why was I talking about that? Do you remember? Uh, we were talking about why people keep saying mainframe's good right right yes and so uh, the the whole idea is that we we make it somebody else's problem and we don't think about the fact that we can take it for granted because of the fact that it's there and we can trust it whereas with the cloud that's what the cloud is is deliberately somebody else's problem because yeah. we want to focus on our core business and let somebody else take care of it and the problem is that on the one hand you've got um the the, the mainframe being taken for granted and, and not, you know, nobody knows about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, shoot. I lost my train of thought again. It's okay. And, and I, can I say this? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Quit treating, love your mainframe again, John Carr. Mm -hmm. Quit treating your mainframe and your mainframers as if they don't matter. Because guess what? Like they keep saying, the mainframe isn't dead. However, all we have to do is just treat it as if it is the million dollar machine that it is. Treat it with love and care and respect. Just like and the, the way people and the people. For that part. Yes. That part. That's the part that we're getting at. And when you do that, guess what happens? Everybody wins. Mm -hmm. That's the cool part. Because it's it's a whole ecosystem and it's a humanitarian effort and don't get me started. <laughs> that's the way that it is and mm -hmm. and and again that's why we have such a good community. That's mm -hmm. why we are so supportive of each other. Mm -hmm. That's why we have the ability to have teach yes, talks to every Sunday because people want to talk about it and they want to be, you know, supportive. And they want to talk about how awesome that the platform is. Now, I want to highlight, if you could show what uh, PJ just uh, texted there. Because, sure. you know, I have to tell you that that is my experience of share. Um, so, uh, um, right there at the bottom one. Uh, there you are. Uh, so, PJ you know, is I saying, can't see. Hug I don't a have my gun. Hug a man. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's literally, that's what I've been doing all morning. As you know, I keep seeing these wonderful mainframers I know. And, you know, so I've, I've gotten more hugs this morning. Than I do in a typical week, you know. It's it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Very good, Josh. Um, oh, PJ didn't put wheels on it. But yeah, that that you know, hug. On the one hand, hug a mainframe. And by the way, um, there are a lot of us who are conspiring to do what uh, Dusty got PJ permission to do, uh, and that is reach out and touch that Lego mainframe if it is here. Uh, if, if I have a chance I, to I hug have, that Lego, Lego have, mainframe, I'm definitely going to do it. I have no dog in that hunt. Okay? I don't know nothing about that. <laughs> Y'all not getting me in trouble. Uh, <laughs> I think they're going to drag I, me into it and be like, you better stand there. <laughs> to touch the, the Lego mainframe from your, uh, uh, from your dusty podcast. From, from my dusty yeah. podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Um, but... Yeah, I think that I think hugging on your mainframe and whatnot, and, and hey, it works out in the standard rack now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so you know, you you it's it's you can quite literally possible. get your arms around it finally. 
for the first time ever. For the first time ever. <laughs> Unless you're Andre the Giant, of course. Well, I mean, whatever. It it is what it is. You keep yeah. saying mainframe. I don't know if you know what that actually means. Right. right. <laughs> Uh, Princess Bride you, reference on Andre the Giant reference, but anyway. Right, yeah. Um, let's see. Make sure you get to see yes. the Lego. Yeah. Is that what he said? Yeah, and, sure. and so I'm going to hug it and never Lego. Sorry. <laughs> that was that was a really bad pun, wasn't it? Awful. <laughs> okay, no. now that we've got the worst pun out of the way, we can back to we can, we can, good conversation. We, it's okay. So I guess... I want to talk about what you're talking about here at Share. Are you? I know you're speaking because you always do. Yeah. So what's your what's your what's well, your thing? So do something uh, unique once again uh, with Tony Perry. Uh, he hey. and I are going to give a, a joint session uh, wow. about uh, how the Be CMO. Tony Perry? Yeah. Well, the guy that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's he's a uh, CEO of Perry Marketing and uh, uh, and um, Santa Rosa Software and. Uh, Ian have done a bunch of things together, and what we're going to do. Wow, he's an IBM champion. Yeah. We're going to do a session about how the CMO and the CTO should be best friends. And too often they end up either at loggerheads or as two ships, as I like to say, colliding in the night. Yeah. Um, you know that that the we in the world of, of computing are so uh, tightly focused on our particular technology sometimes that we forget how essential we are to the business. And we often fail to learn what is the business that we're there for because we're so focused on the particular bits and bytes we're responsible for. Uh, and so by finding a way to get the CMO and the CTO talking to each other, then that helps everybody because you've got the left and right leg, if you will, of, of the business in some ways, you know, walking, you know, coordinating with each other versus, you know, having no idea about each other. Yeah. So we're going to give a presentation Thursday morning at 1030 about that. Oh, that's going to be good. Oh, we're going to have fun. We've we've had fun designing it, and we're going to practice a little yeah. bit more for the next couple of days before we actually present it. <laughs> yeah, he's he's super. He's super. Oh, yeah. Well, it's um, going to be a blast. Yeah, it's going to be really, really good. Um, And then what about the book? Uh, the book. So are y'all going to do a part two or? Uh, well, let me just echo what Carl Eric said. Uh, I thought I was going to get, I don't want no echoes. <laughs> I thought I was going to get the tea. What's what's uh, happening? So no, uh, we we do uh, meet roughly every Saturday morning, um, Saturday actually Saturday afternoon slash evening now. But yeah. um, and we're looking at updating it and expanding it. Uh, our first version of the book, which we're all quite proud, was written just before the tell them came online. <laughs> you know, uh, so now we got to tell them about that. Uh, we we you gonna tell them about the yeah tell them about the tell, uh, <laughs> and uh, and a whole lot of other stuff. Looking at, uh, yeah, at, at you know what else needs to be in the book, and so what we're hoping is a lot of folks will uh, will give us feedback about what they would like to see in the book, so that we would do the next version of the book. It really includes additional stuff that people say, "Hey, yeah, I like the book. I'd like this even more in it." Um, yeah. Now I should mention that if you're here at Share, then I'm going to uh, break a rule and stand up and show people map back to Iceberg. Oh, the QR code. Well, I don't know if you can see it and map it or not, but the if not. Uh, TC, I can, um, yeah, I'll can link it. Pub in publish the, the link to the, the uh, book website. When I do uh, the edits, I will, like I always do, I will link it, link the book uh, in the YouTube edits. So, oh, my battery. Oh, your battery. So, and there's no plug. So, it looks like we might have a frustration for our outlets here. Yeah. Um, so, it looks like we are. We are going to have to cut it short. Okay, uh, so let me just mention one other thing I'm going to be doing is actually being interviewed for the main school, uh, and that's something that's, that's, uh, that's sponsored. huge. Yeah, and so I'm going to be actually doing that on Tuesday, so I'm really looking forward to that as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're we're having a blast here at Share. Uh, so yeah. really, you know, come to Share and get your mainframe hooks and your main framer hooks. Yeah. Uh, this this is the this is the place to be, and you know, just to discover that you naturally fit into this community, that you are actually part of something world-class, historical, uh, that runs the world economy. And, and it's su such an aha moment for, for mainframers to discover just how important they individually are as part of something so, you know, so, uh, I, I, I want to use a really big um, 
uh, word, and, and I can't think of the right one that's big enough, you know, is a spectacularly important. So, anyway, um, since we're getting low on battery here, maybe I'll let you sort of wind things up. Okay, I'll wind them up. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> No, no, seriously, I really appreciate everybody um, and all of your support. We have had such a wonderful time and I'll be sure to post a whole bunch of pictures and um, keep you updated. We have um, a line queue here and it's going to start getting really, really loud. And I recognize almost everybody in that line, which is super cool. Yeah, there's there's like there's all stars in the line. I'm not going to drop well, any names. Dusty, is, that, is that Dusty there or is it just somebody like Dusty? I don't know. I, but Ed I, Jaffe is there. Um, we are going to go and enjoy the conference once once it starts. Um, but I want to I want to give a quick shout out to ESPN 1061 uh, RVA. Uh, I'd also like to give a quick shout out to IBM Champions everywhere. Hey everybody, and uh, thank you so much for joining. And thanks, Reg. My pleasure. High five. High so five. glad we finally got around to doing this, and I'm really happy we got to do it in person. We got to do it in person at share live and thanks dusty appreciate it and we'll talk to you soon so bye everybody